welcome everyone for this first session of Tevox 2018. Um, we're going to talk about Gradle, and the way we're going to look at Gradle is really um, to bring you in into what Gradle can bring you, both when you're a developer that has to use Gradle, because your organization, your project is using Gradle as the build tool, and then also if you start authoring uh, builds yourself, uh, what you need to know to properly understand Gradle um, and, uh, and get great builds that perform fast and are easy to reuse for others in your organization. So that's the main objective. Who are we? Well, first of all, my colleague here, Cédric Champeau, um, did a few things with a language that's been known and around for quite some time, Groovy, um, static compiler and a number of things in there. Um, he, he says that he writes a lot of bugs, but I guess at least it means he's doing something. So, uh, yeah, fixing is also important. Um, and um, was the co-author of the Groovy in Action 2 book um, and has a number of um, open source contributions. And so he's green, so he's been working for Braille for a bit more than six, six months, I think. Yeah. yeah so joined the, the same team as I work for, so I, I work for the defense team and team at Braille, and jo uh, he joined me in that team. And before that, he used to work for Terracotta, working on difficult uh, things like caching and <laughs> all the problems that you can have. And we are going to talk about caching today. Uh, at the end of this session, so this is an interesting topic. Just as a side note, uh, we noticed that there was a, there could be a little misunderstanding about the title of this session, so if you expect some adult content today, this is not going to be the case, right? You can go. Yeah. So, what's Gradle? Well, the purpose of Gradle is to be a build and an automation tool. Um, it is JVM based, implemented in Java, even though you've got a Groovy and a Kotlin DSL. The, the core of Gradle runs as a Java application. Um, it is an Apache license software, so 100% free, open source. You can use it for any project you want. Um, you can contribute to it. Um, we're out there on GitHub. Um, and the idea behind Gradle is to be an agnostic build system. So really, it's of course well known in the Java ecosystem for building from Java to Groovy application, Kotlin, Scala ones, uh, but it has also uh, a number of tools dedicated to other ecosystems like the native one with C, C++, Swift support. Um, you probably have heard Android is now using Gradle as its recommended build tool. Um, and of course, uh, through contributions and plugins, we've got support for Go, Rust, ASCII Doctor, all kind of things out there. So really, the, 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 the philosophy behind the tool is to be able to organize all of these um, underlying technologies so that your application, which most often nowadays has multiple stacks in it, uh, can work. And so we, probably that slide is missing also. There are a bunch of integration for the JavaScript ecosystem as well. So a couple of figures about the project, just to give you an idea. We're going beyond 7 million downloads a month, so it keeps growing and it's, uh, it's starting to be interesting figures. Um, there was a study a couple of years back that named it one of the most 20 important open source projects. Um, we've got now beyond 35 full-time engineers working on making both the build tool and some of the enterprise uh, offering we have. Uh, we'll have a couple of slides at the end for that. Um, uh, so working on yeah, evolving the project, evolving what it can do. Uh, performance is a very, very important aspect at Gradle. Um, we're very serious about that. Um, just to give you a bit an idea of the size, so for example, uh, at LinkedIn, we're talking about 300,000 builds a week. So that's clearly a huge amount of build time, and that means 
whenever you manage to shave a couple seconds or even a couple minutes out of bills, this scales tremendously, like the moment you, you, you're improving the uh, performance of your development team. Behind the open source project, there is a company. I mean, we're full-time engineers. We're also getting paid. Um, that's an interesting perk of the job, but that means also there is a company behind there. Um, and what the company strives for is to bring build happiness um, in the sense that we want engineers to be as, more, as much as possible productive on their project and not have to spend time waiting for builds to happen. I mean, everybody knows the uh, XKCD cartoon where you see uh, the guys fighting with swords and saying, well, you know, my app is compiling. So we're trying to make that disappear and so that you can really focus on your application. Um, so I've said it, full-time engineer. Um, we've got two, two products, um, the Gradle build scans um, as a setup that you can have inside your company, which allows you to, we'll explain what a build scan is in a minute, uh, which allows you then to coordinate build scans for all your projects and have really great insights on what's happening um, in your build environment. Um, and then a, the Gradle Enterprise also provides a, a way to administer the cache backend for the Gradle cache. And again, as Cedric hinted at, we'll have an, an explanation about what the Gradle cache is um, at the end. Ways to get money, consulting, support, development services. Um, I mean, yeah, we've, we've got to be paid effectively. Um, and of course, trainings. Uh, there are tons of free trainings, actually, through webinars or even recorded ones. So if you want to know more, if you want to dive deeper than what we can do in three hours, um, just have a look. Um, information is out there. The one last slide about Gradle. We're also growing fast for the moment. Um, so we're hiring. We're a fully distributed development team. It's an exciting project used by millions of developers out there. Um, we've got both positions on the build tool team, so working on the open source tool itself and, and growing the usefulness of it, um, and also the Gradle Enterprise positions, which includes also front-end uh, development. Um, so pretty much anything you hear from now sounds exciting and an interesting challenge to work on. Well, talk to us. You've got the Gradle.com careers, or we've got a booth. Uh, the exhibition hall opens tomorrow. Uh, come talk to us. We'll be happy to have a chat. And that's you for the objectives. Yeah. So before we dig into the objectives, I need to know a bit more about you. So how many of you already use Gradle today? Okay. How many are using Maven and only Maven? Right. Uh, any other big tool? And make file? <laughs> SBT? Okay. Custom shell scripts. Hey, still. <laughs> so the objective today is to get you started with Gradle. And what we mean by that is that uh, as a user, you check out a project on Git or whatever. You have a Gradle project, you need to find your way out and understand how you can build your project, run tests, etc. So we're going to cover the basics around that. But then, as you gain knowledge, you're going to have to look at the build files, maybe tweak them, introduce some new tasks, etc. etc. So we're going to introduce this also, how you can uh, add new tasks, how you can make them actually safer, faster, etc. And we organize that with this agenda to cover almost anything that we need we think you need just to, to get started with Gradle in three hours. So, first, uh, we're going to show that later we have the, just the anatomy of a Gradle project. So, you check out something, recognize what is the Gradle file, uh, what you have, what is the wrap, etc. Uh, then, uh, how to use Gradle from the command line, maybe a bit from the IDE, all the demos that we're going to do are actually going to be integrated with the IDE, so we're going to, to see how it works. And then we're going to introduce the concepts around Gradle. So uh, it's good to know that you have a task that's private. How are they organized together? How they play together with uh, I don't know, the concept of uh, plugin, the concept of um, conventions, so all, all these things. And then uh, you need to know 
why you're using Gradle rather than a different build tool. And one of the biggest advantages of Gradle is that it is made for incremental builds, and we're going to explain what it means really to be incremental and to be fast. I'm uh, going to talk a bit about advanced configuration, um, dependency management. Uh, I mentioned that when I work in C, this is a huge topic that deserves three hours by itself. So this is just going to be a short intro of uh, dependency management. And then in the end we're going to talk about caching, which may be a bit different to what you have in mind, especially in the Maven uh, uh, mental uh, process. So, so far we've got it. Maybe just one thing we yeah. forgot to say, we've got, whoa, I'm gonna be farther away from you. Uh, we've got um, Twitter hashtags and our Twitter handles, so if you've got questions, um, and we don't see you waving or shouting. Uh, that's also another way, uh, because we're two. One of us can check the, the Twitter feed. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we should. <laughs> uh, you can raise hands. I mean, we have three of us, so we have time to, to, yeah, to, to, to answer questions. Uh, also, yeah, maybe we need to mention, we're going to have a break. It's not going to be three hours and you don't have to, to leave, so don't worry about that. So, uh, first thing, Gradle is convention based, right? So if you check out the Gradle project and you work in the Java ecosystem and you use Maven, you're not going to be lost. The conventions are basically the same. So you will find sources in source main Java, you find resources in source main resources, etc. etc. So Gradle is not different in that regard. It brings ways you have conventions differently than Maven, but basically it's exactly the same. So we have the source files, and something that you have to be aware of is that the name of the project by default is the name of the folder that you check out for us to. This can be changed, but this is really simple. And then this is the first which I'm going to try to do. Yeah, it works. Yeah. That's great. So he, here the point is, I mean, let's be honest. With the history, people are used to Ant, or we've got a really large user base of Maven projects. And so when you're faced with a Gradle project, well, if you start looking for the pom.xml file, that's not going to happen. So what are the important files in a Gradle project, and how do I interact with it? So here on the left, we see the tree of the project. Um, we've got effectively um, a dot .gradle. It's a project, a folder that's going to be created by Gradle when running a number of things. Um, the idea is because of the ID import. Then we've got a Gradle folder that's actually part of what you check in. We'll go inside in a minute. The classical source main, and then you've got the Java resources, test Java. Uh, just as a history, this is a, a Terracotta project that I took over and trans translated from Maven to Gradle as, as an example. Um, as an example project. Then the main Gradle file is the one we've got open here. Oops. So that's effectively uh, what defines the build and what the builds contain. And so you can see that we've got a number of plugins. Um, we're specifying the group and a version. Uh, we've got a description. Um, we've got the Java version. Repositories to connect to in order to get dependencies. A number of dependency declaration. Um, a find bugs configuration. Um, a specific task to generate a source jar, um, the definition of the artifacts, and we're passing a couple options to the uh, Java compiler for any compile task. We're going to explain a lot of these concepts in the, con in the um, um, session today, but that's a good declarative Gradle build file. Just, you didn't mention the language. Of the oh, and that one is a Kotlin file. So that's why you've got the .kts extension, uh, as opposed to not having that extension and just having build.gradle. Um, so how many of you are actually aware that you can write Gradle build files either Ruby or Kotlin? Okay. So most of the demos are going to use the Kotlin lesson today. Uh, just as a side note, actually uh, Gradle file is going to be out maybe this week, maybe next week. Uh, at least uh, a new RC this week that's... What? No, the RC2 was published 20 minutes ago. Like, all our demos are out of date. And, uh, yeah, one of the highlights of this 
version is the coupling itself. And this is really, really nice for the demos and the translation that you can have. Yeah. So aside from the main build file, we've got a properties file. Um, that, for example, just allows you to specify a couple of properties. So that's a, an internal property. Um, usually, Gradle projects have a settings.gradle.kts in the root. Um, so here, we name the project. And as you see, we also have a build cache configuration that, for the moment, is um, um, commented out. Um, yeah, as you've seen, like I said, it was a migration, so we still have the original POM file of the project. Now, in the Gradle folder, what we have here is the wrapper. And the wrapper is a jar and a properties file, and that's where, for example, you can specify which Gradle distribution is going to be used. So, Gradle comes, most Gradle projects will come with the uh, wrapper installed, and you'll also notice that from the Gradle W and Gradle W.bat file, so these two guys there. Um, and that allows anyone that has to interact with a Gradle project to not think about the Gradle version that's needed. You just get the project and use this wrapper file, and if you don't have the right Gradle version on your machine, it will be downloaded first and used from then on for that project. And if the project maintainers decide to upgrade the Gradle version, well, again, the next time you upgrade a project locally, if there is a new Gradle version that's being used by the project and you don't have it, download again, then use, use from now on. So that's pretty much the, the structure um, of, of a Gradle project. And we'll go into interacting with it um, in the next minutes. Back to you, Cedric. Okay. So this was a simple structure of a project. Uh, of course, Gradle also supports multi-project builds. And if you're familiar with Maven, that is the same concept, ex except that in Maven it's called a module. In Gradle, we have projects. So main projects, sub-projects, exactly the same as modules. Right? So if you have a multi-project build, basically you can have different sub-directories, and each of them would have their own build files. So to summarize, what you can have is a build file, by default name build.gradle for Groovy DSLs, and build.gradle.kts for Kotlin DSL files. And you can mix them. This is not a problem. Um, this file describes the build and describes the configuration of your build. And in most cases, actually, it could, it could be a really, really short file. I mean, it doesn't have to be thousands of lines of code or whatever. It's really simple. And then you have those companion files, the settings that riddle, which configures the project name, uh, how you use, compose the different uh, modules in a multi project build. And the Gradle.properties file is really where you would put some static information like the, the version number or um, yeah, different properties that you can use in the build you can do it. Some differences with regards to Maven. Um, in Maven, the output directory is called target. In Gradle, it's called build. This is the only difference that you would have between the two in terms of outputs. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that quickly. Actually, the build source directory, I'm going to mention that later in some demo, so I need to explain that. Uh, just be aware that you have a dot .gradle directory, which is created by Gradle for each project. And um, don't delete it, but don't check it into CI, either into uh, uh, VCS. I mean, this is just state for Gradle for incremental nests and all caches. So this is something that you have to be aware of. So, we mentioned that quickly, let's talk about the Gradle wrapper. The Gradle wrapper is actually something that is really, really important. What it means is that if you check out a product and you don't have Gradle, this is not a problem. Because what you're going to run is a command that is going to download the Gradle distribution that is needed to build the project without anything as a prerequisite. Uh, actually, this is not true, you still need a JDK. Yeah. Um, so you need Java installed, but at least if you have Java, Gradle would bootstrap itself. So it doesn't mean that it's going to download Gradle for each of the invocations that you're going to do. So it's going to download one version, and if it has it locally, it's not going to download. So it's, it's cached. This 
allows the project to control the gradle version that is used to build the project. Because one of the, the issues with builds is making sure that you can reproduce the build. And the build to version is something really important. It is part of the tool chain to build the project. So a difference in the version can already make differences in the outputs. You, you can see that happening with Maven, but this could also happen with Gradle. If you have a newer Gradle version, maybe you're using deprecated methods today, and uh, it means that if you upgrade and those methods disappeared, then the product is not going to be for newer versions. So you have to make sure that the version you use is the right one. So you check that into VCS. And it, it gives some extra flexibility also to the Gradle team in the sense that we can effectively deprecate things and then remove them to clean up um, patterns that didn't work out in the end or concepts that were replaced by better ones, all of that. And we can do that knowing that we're not going to like surprise anyone because then it's a decision to upgrade your Gradle version and you've got the time to look at, okay, can I do it now? Is it like a quick two minutes running a command upgrading, or is it a bit longer because I need to refactor of some of my build scripts? Um, the second thing is you can also, for larger companies, um, the, the, the early point at can be a local Gradle distribution that your company assembled. Um, and that allows them, for example, to have custom scripts and things like that. So one of the frequent things you see in companies is that you have to go through a blessed repository. You're not supposed to go to Maven Central or JCenter. Uh, because the company wants to have some control on the artifacts that get embedded in your application. Um, you can do that via Gradle distribu distribution, and then potentially none of the projects in your, in your company have to worry about declaring repositories. It's all done by the dis distribution. So that's also uh, some of the features the wrapper brings. Yeah. So we do have some customers who actually have custom distributions and bundles some plugins, some internal company plugins directly in the distribution. And it is applied automatically. So you have a build script that doesn't apply, doesn't seem to apply in a plugin, but it is effectively applying because it uses a custom distribution. Um, something I also need to mention about the wrapper is that you, you probably s seen that quickly in the demo, but there's a jar file. And this jar file is going to be checked in the VCS. So for some people, uh, they're st starting to cry and say, no, you should never push a jar file into the VCS. This is an exception, right? This is for the good. <laughs> And um, I mean, yeah, this is just the, the minimal thing that you have to do so that Gradle can bootstrap itself. This is safe. This is not uh, something really nasty to do in this case. OK, so next step is that during this session, we're going to talk a lot about build scans. So how many of you already tried or know what is a build scan? Cool, so only one person. Hey. <laughs> so this is going to be used transparently during this, this session because it is extremely useful. Basically, you scan, build scans are a shareable uh, fingerprint of your build. And it gives you insights about what happened during a build. So this is a record of everything that happened during a build. It records. Uh, what command line you did, what dependencies have been used, uh, information about the operating system, the hardware. Uh, it will collect multiple things. Uh, Louis is going to do a demo, but it gives you a lot of insights. But the main advantage is that this is shareable. So I guess that a lot of you already face this issue that you have a build that you run locally and it fails. Right? And then you go to your colleague and say, hey, we have you seen this error, you know? And you paste a small stack trace. And then we say, yeah, hmm, this looks familiar, but you didn't, didn't give me the full stack trace. Can you just give me back this? Uh, oops, actually, I ran another build and it passed, and then the error went away. So this would not happen with the build scan because everything that happens is going to be recorded. This, the, the, the full stack trace would be there and then you can share a URL. So I could share this URL with Louis and he would see everything that happened. And this is just an example of what you can do. And let's see that in more details. Yep. So is that actually readable till the end of the room? 
I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> so effectively, that's the, 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 the interface for looking at build scans. So build scans are really much more than just archiving your, the logs of the build. It is really taking that data in and presenting it in a way that's really useful. And as Cedric said, one of the main features of the build scan is that pretty much everything you click, you drill down, you go, et cetera, et cetera, ends up with a unique URL. And so that when you share it with someone, it is that URL exactly. And they'll end up with the exact same view. So you're immediately talking about the same thing instead of saying, oh yeah, go to the console log tab and then scroll down 256 lines. And then, I mean, you get the point. So here we see that um, it was a build done by Cedric. Um, that it was uh, the Groovy project, and uh, what ran was a clean dist install artifactory publish. Should I ask you why you run clean? No, this I'm was kidding. on CI. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, can, you can see when the build was taken, when it was finished, which Gradle version, the build scan plugin itself. Um, you've got even a link to the CI system that created it. Um, we can go into the console log. So that's pretty much the row found the row, not even the row, the enhanced the exact log yeah. of the, um, the, the, the build. So you see, we see, we see a couple of warnings. So for example, if I wanted to discuss that ASCII doctor warning, that's it. If you look at the URL, I've got the console log and then I know I'm on line 118 um, and I could share that with a colleague and discuss, hey, could we make these warning goes away because really they're annoying. Um, I, I'd rather not we have any red in here. Um, we saw also that the build had a couple of deprecations. So for example, the property class method has been deprecated, could be removed in 5.0. Well, that's already a warning for the Groovy team that potentially migrating from their build from the latest Gradle 4.10 to 5.0, they may have to do some work in order to clean up these uh, deprecations. Um, and a similar other one, which is about um, annotation processor. So for example, the annotation processor warning is not really that what you're doing is no longer going to work. It's that we've got a much better way of making it work. And so if you follow the documentation and update your build, uh, you're going to get incremental annotation processor and all, all that kind of goodness. Uh, what's interesting is that you also see the timeline. So you know which tasks took a long time, which tasks actually did nothing because they were up to date. Um, if you're integrating with the build cache, you will see which tasks were actually recovered from the cache instead of being run. Um, you can have performance analysis. So that gives you all the timings, um, memory usage, um, I mean, on the configuration side of things also, what happened, which project, which, what did Gradle have to execute initially uh, before running your build effectively? And, and again, that's something we're going to discuss later on because it's an important aspect of Gradle is understanding what happens when you run a Gradle build. Um, some network activity. Does that make sense? Well, file downloaded, data downloaded zero, so I guess that was fast. Um, and again, it's a multi-project, so you see all the different sub-projects in there. You can navigate the dependencies. So for example, like what does Groovy Ant uses on its compile class path? Okay, these two things. Ant actually depends also on the Ant launcher. I mean, all that navigation is available. Plugins, and w we could go on. Um, I don't know if yeah. there is something special you want no, to No, it's just that we're going to use that during this talk, and uh, yeah. yeah. Basically, use it, abuse it. Uh, this is free, so everything that you see there is free, and I'm going to explain how you can have it. So first, how to enable that. If you use the latest Gradle version, just add dash dash scan, and that's all, and you would get the scan. So we didn't say it, but this is available locally on your laptop, on CI. It doesn't matter. We collect all the builds whenever uh, you do it uh, with dash dash stand, or you can configure it to do it for every build if you need to, if you want to. Uh, so if you just do that using dash dash scan, it's just going to ask you to accept the terms um, because uh, by default, this is going to be pushed on a public server. So everything that you're going to push is going to be public if you share the URL, right? Um, if you don't want that, uh, this is also what we need uh, <laughs> to, to, yeah, we, we need to do. So, so if you want to pay us to get a, an, an enterprise a build, actually you can have that on your local server and with more features. But I'm not going to mention that today. Um, so if you want to have it, 
and not have to accept the terms of license every time with dash dash scan, which can be a bit annoying. Just add this configuration block build scan uh, with the accept license. So just need to be warned. And using Riddle, that's your turn. OK. So again, we've seen a little bit of the anatomy, but how the heck do I interact with that new Griddle thingy in my project? So first of all, like we've said, the way you're going to most often interact with the project is by using that Griddle W. On Windows, you've got the dot .bat, specify it or not, depending on the shell you're using. And then you're giving a number of task names. Um, conceptually, the way Gradle is thought is that you end up interacting with the project from its root directory. You no longer have to navigate in the different sub-projects. If you want to do a specific thing, you'll invoke it by specifying the exact task. Um, and, and so, yeah, you stay there. So you pretty much have one terminal window open, and then you do a couple, the, the, the different things that you need on your project. So invoking a specific task is just passing in task name, space separated, um, with potential options. So a couple of tasks can have like uh, command line options, so you can specify there. Um, you can also override properties. Um, we'll see that when we talk about properties later on. Um, and the way you reference a specific task in a specific project is that last line. So this column server is effectively saying that this, pro this Gradle project has a sub-project server, and what I want to run is the tests of that specific sub-project. And then Gradle will do its magic so that your server test can run. And again, we're going to talk about the magic later on, um, explaining how the uh, execution engine um, gets wired and, and executed. Now, it can be daunting when you don't know a lot about the project to discover which tasks are runnable. And so one thing you can do is run Gradle W tasks, and that will give you a list of all the tasks that have a description attached to them, so that they're effectively, by attaching a description to a task, you're kind of saying to Gradle, well, that's a task useful for an end user, so when they request that information, please present it. Um, and then you can even drill deeper by um, getting help on a specific task. So this time, Gradle help, dash dash task, and the task name. And it will tell you which projects have that task, um, give some usage context. So if the tasks are, for example, uh, common line switches, they will be there, um, all that kind of, of information. Sometimes, not often, you may want to exclude a task from the execution. Uh, let's say you're trying to verify static analysis, but you don't really want to run find bugs or spot bugs because it takes too long. Um, or you want to exclude tests. One way of doing it is by using the dash dash exclude task, or dash x, and that ex ex effectively excludes all the tasks that have that name from your execution graph. And why am I saying all? Well, because if you're in a multi-project environment, the test task can exist on each and every project. And so here, for example, we're doing a build minus x test. So that's going to build the whole project, but not execute the tests. Note that, of course, if there are tasks that depended upon the test execution, they can't be run, because, oh, no, sorry, it's the opposite. The test task yeah. actually depends on, for example, compiling the test classes. Well, since you said I don't want to execute the tests, if nothing else requires the compilation of the test classes, they just won't get compiled. So Gradle will keep optimizing what needs to be done. Something that, that's sometimes useful, uh, you may want to continue a build. Uh, by default, Gradle will stop executing the moment the task fails. Um, with that option, you can actually tell it, well, don't worry, please execute everything. Um, so for example, if you know you've got a couple of tests failing here and there in different projects, but you still want to run the complete, complete test suite over all the projects, that's one way of doing it. Um, this time, the tasks that depended upon the failed task will not be run. Because obviously, the task failed. We can't, I mean, there is no way we can, we should not even try to run tasks that require the result. Another interesting feature that I should have activated here, and then we wouldn't have that um, extra item in the agenda because I forgot to regenerate, is the continuous build part. So for example, what, what we could do here with the presentation is launch ASCII doctor task 
dash t to be continuous, and every time we were to do a modification in the sources of the presentation, we would get the slides regenerated and a refresh would still be needed in the browser, but we would get immediately the updated version. And so that's with the dash t, um, and you've got control d in order to stop the, the Gradle execution. And so it will be monitoring your changes, and so you can do that, for example, on a test task. And then when you change code, anything that ends up imp impacting the test task will re-trigger a build and will execute everything. So one thing that matters when you're running a build, and especially um, when you're interacting with your project, it's the logging. Um, Gradle has a number of logging levels. Um, you'll recognize some of the usual ones. Uh, I guess one extra is the lifecycle one. Um, so <coughs> by default, Gradle logs at the lifecycle level. It's mostly about telling you that we're making progress on your build. And that's pretty much it. If you print line inside your build, that will show up. Um, some tasks will have um, ad added logging based on that, but it's going to be mostly about the Gradle lifecycle. And it's pretty minimalistic because we don't want to like, throw at you tons of information when effectively we expect the build to be most, most of the time OK. However, you can, of course, configure that logging level. And you've got command line flags uh, to set it at different levels. So the dash i is for info level, dash q is for debug. Um, quiet. Hmm? Quiet. Oh, sorry, quiet. Yeah, my bad. Uh, minus D for debug, that makes more sense. Um, so quiet will be even less verbose. Info will be more verbose than lifecycle. Um, usually info will have what, we, what you need when you're trying to uh, make sense of a failed bill or something like that. Um, debug really has a ton of outputs. Debug would be more if you're a build author starting to author some of some Gradle tasks or Gradle plugins and having some weird interaction issues in the build itself. Um, Note that, uh, by default, uh, the, the logging level of Gradle will not print stack traces. Um, if you want stack traces to be shown, there is another flag, which is dash dash stack traces, or minus s. Um, and then you'll see the full stack trace of something that happened. Um, but for example, if you've got a failing build, it's not going to be the, the stack trace. Uh, sorry, if you've got a failing test, it's not going to be the stack trace of the failing test. That still is handled by the test runner. It's going to be the stack trace of Gradle telling you that the test task failed. So that's why we don't print them by default, because most of the time, the stack trace is a Gradle stack trace, so not really something you're, you want to dig into. Um, what you want to dig into is the cause of the task failure. So a frequent question we get when you migrate from Maven, which has a pretty well-defined life cycle for a project, from compilation to packaging jar to installing them in the local repo to potentially deploying them. And people come to Gradle and like, don't you have that lifecycle concept? Well, the way Gradle does it is we have what we call convention tasks that are defined by built-in plugins. Um, we'll go over um, the concept of these built-in plugins later. Um, but they're effectively useful entry points for a developer interacting with the project. So for example, one of them is the assemble task. Assemble is exactly that. We need the output of your project to be produced. So that's going to create your jar files. It's going to create your application package, if you've configured one, um, these kind of things. Now the question is, do you need to run tests in order to produce a jar file? And the answer is no, and so assemble will not run tests. That's not what it does. It's really about assembling things. So the usual, I mean, not, not so usual, but the frequent Maven command, which is, you know, Maven install minus d skip tests, that's not something you do in Gradle, because in Gradle, the running from the test and the assembling of the jar are completely different execution path. Of course, sometimes you want to do both, don't get me wrong. Another example, then, if you want to do both, uh, if you want to do the test side, is check. And that's a convention task which will execute all the verification tasks that are recorded with it. Um, on one hand side, you've got the tests. So usually when you create a test task, it's going to be a dependency of the check task. So that means running check will run all the tests. 
And it's the same for the um, code quality plugins you find out there. Most frequently, um, they will um, give you the, um, oh, sorry, water. Um, yeah, so most frequently, the um, static analysis task will be again wired to the check, so that effectively, if, if you run check, you have on both hands the testing that happens and the spot bugs, find bugs, sonar, whatever you name it, um, and potentially the tool in your native tool chain, um, if that's what you're using. And of course, again, if we're talking about convention, sometimes what you really need is both to get your application assembled, but also completely checked. And so that's what build does. Build is effectively saying, and it's the only thing it does. It is just a task that says, oh, I do nothing as a task, but I happen to depend on assemble and check. And so when you execute build, it has to execute the other two. What happens if you invoke Gradle without an argument? Well, by default, the help task is printed. Uh, that's a nice discovery way, if you want. Um, however, inside a project, you can actually configure the default task. Um, and so if you really want to be lazy, lazy, you can have a shorter uh, alias for Gradle W, and you can have default tasks in your project, and then potentially with a one or two keystroke, you get your build running. Is that clear? <laughs> Let's hope it is, right? It's okay. Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but at least, I mean, people are not yet too comfortable <laughs> in the cinema seats. Nobody is too much asleep. I mean, the rest of the week might be harder, depending on how much party you're doing. Um, a Gradle comes also with what we call the Gradle daemon. Um, by default, for a couple of versions now, when you start a Gradle build, what happens is that you're starting a short-lived JVM that's going to, well, it's going to stay there for the, for the execution of your build, but it's going to trigger a long-running process in the background uh, that will be executing your build. The main benefit of that is you have a warmed-up JVM. If you, I mean, anyone who's deployed an application in production and had to do a little bit of performance uh, look at his application will know about warming up a JVM, like the JIT kicking in and all of that. And so the benefit of the Gradle daemon is to, to use all that goodness, because otherwise you would end up with short-lived JVM, had no time to optimize, not good for anyone. Um, and of course, sometimes <laughs> it may not be what you want, so you can use our Gradle daemon to disable it, like if you set it to false. Um, you should no longer have to do that. Um, if your build works without the daemon, but doesn't with the daemon, and it's not your build's fault, um, that's a potential discussion either on the Gradle user forums or even a a bug report opened on the, on the Gradle issue tracker, because it's a very important feature of Gradle. It's part of its performance promise, is we need the daemon to be able to deliver that. Just to, to continue on this, so there are actually two situations where you can face this issue with the daemon that you have to disable. And uh, I've been pinged a couple of times on Twitter on people saying, hey, I have to disable the daemon because it doesn't work. And every time I checked, actually the problem wasn't on Gradle itself, it was often on a plugin and typically a plugin that would keep a file open and never close it. So if you face a problem with the daemon, please report the problem either to the Gradle team or the plugin author so that they fix it. Because we're not talking about 5% improvement. If you use the daemon, you can have builds that are maybe twice as fast. This is really, really a huge improvement, so use it. <laughs> yeah, and the second, the second property that relates to the daemon is how long should a daemon JVM stay up if it's not being used. So that's effectively also another optimization. You've run a Gradle build once two weeks ago. No, you no longer have a daemon running there. I mean, it died after a while. We don't want to clutter your machine with, like, you've run 10 Gradle builds in <coughs> parallel, and then you've got, what, 10 JVMs running in the background forever? Can't have that. So, again, um, I think it's half an hour, something like that, by default. So. I don't remember. But, but if you need to tweak that, make it shorter, or potentially make it longer, um, that's, that's the way of doing this. The second thing that Gradle is really, really awesome at, um, and that's one of the things that made me uh, move to Gradle projects uh, a couple of years back, 
Um, it's the parallel building. Um, it's been baked inside Gradle itself. Um, and you really can then benefit from it the moment you've got a multi-project, because Gradle will create the execution graph, and based on that execution graph, will run as many things as it can in parallel. Um, that means also that running a Gradle build can be taxing for your machine, but at the end of the day, the goal is that you get your result as fast as possible. Um, so, of course, again, you can disable that um, with using the R Gradle parallel, um, but really, same, same as with the daemon. If your build doesn't work in parallel, you're missing a lot of the Gradle performance, and so you should look into why is that happening. Um, note that we're talking about parallel across projects, not inside a project. So if you've got multiple test tasks in the same project, they will run sequentially. Um, they may run tests themselves in parallel, but otherwise they will run sequentially. Um, however, if you've got a client project and a server project, both their test tasks can run in parallel. And if you just do the simple math of saying, okay, I've got five projects, 10 minutes of test per project, that's 50 minutes end to end. Well, if you can run them five in parallel, suddenly you've got getting down to 10 minutes. So, I mean, it's, it's really a game changer. Um, one thing you can do if you're running builds a lot on your local machine is reduce a little bit the max workers because otherwise they will take the number of CPUs as reported by the JVM. And sometimes it might be a bit annoying if you're trying to do something else. Um, when you see a colleague disappear in the middle of a call because um, Gradle decided, oh no, it's time for parallelism. Um, it, again, it's the, the handling of the feature, right? On the one side, it's awesome and everything, but sometimes, yes, if it happens on your local machine, you may want to constrain it a bit. And so with all of that said, let's have Cedric show us a little bit yeah. of <coughs> Gradle in practice. So just uh, another mention regarding parallel builds. So we also have an API called the Worker API, and this one is actually really, really nice because it allows intra-project parallelism. So if you build your plugins using this API, actually, the, the task within a single project can be parallelized. So this is just to complete the, yeah. the slide. Okay, so this one. You're all good. Okay, awesome. So you told me that you have this terracotta project. I don't know anything about Gradle. This is a bit scary, but you told me I can do something on the command line, right? So something like Gradle W tasks. And you told me it's going to, oh yeah, so, so I get some information there. So when I run tasks, it's going to tell me everything that probably matters for me. So can I can see that I have build can tasks. You zoom just oh yeah, I can zoom. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's change the profile and increase the font size. Um, so you can see that I'm using Linux. Is it better? Okay. So I have some build tasks. Assemble, you mentioned that, build, and I have a description of what they do, so that's pretty nice. So just reading that, I guess that if I run Gradle test, it's actually going to execute the tests. So let's see that, it's compiling, executing the tests. Awesome. So you can see what it's running, that the like Louis mentioned, the, 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 the CLI is really terse. It doesn't tell you much. It only shows you what you need to know at the moment. And the only thing you need to know precisely now is that it is running this bar splitting test, right? So it's a bit slow. Terracotta is a bit yeah. slow, no? <laughs> no, it does a lot of tests. Oh, it does a lot of tests, right. So once this is going to be completed, I'm going to show you what you get locally. Come on. Yeah. So the output is complete and I have this little link to a build scan. And I can click on this and then again, let's zoom a bit. Control plus. Yeah, I'm trying to find, yeah, this one. Okay. So 
I can understand a little more about the bill just looking at this bill scan. So I didn't have to look at the bill file itself to understand that actually it has some plugins applied. And it has, for example, the FindBot plugin applied. I can see the console log and actually this one is complete, right? So when I was executing the build, it was really terse and just telling me what is it's actually doing right now. But with the build scan, I get the full record. So I can come back and see, okay, actually it was running compiled Java, then process resources, classes, and I can find that in the timeline. So I can see this happening as we go and I have all the records of what is happening. That's pretty cool. And if I do this again, this is going to change for you used to Maven. So who can tell me what is going to happen if I run this task again? Yes. Should be faster, yeah. How faster is the question? It's immediate. Zero. So why does Gradle run zero? <laughs> Nothing there. Actually, I can click again on this bit scan. And if I go to the timeline, I can see that everything is up to date. So this is a major difference with Maven, right? Compile Java was up to date. We already done Compile Java. We already done process resources, classes, etc. But for tests, this is also the, the case. I mean, the tests have been executed. So I will not execute the test again, right? So often when I say that, there's always someone saying, hey, I need to run my test again. I say, why do you have to run the test again? Because sometimes they fail. Well, first thing, fix your tests. If they fail sometimes, then it's a flaky test, you have to fix them. Or your builds are not reproducible, and actually you may ship something which is broken on, on production. So fix your test. And really, if you want to re-execute the test because you're running locally and you want to debug that flaky test, you can do that. So I'm going to run Gradle W, and I'm going to add this um, rerun, sorry, rerun tasks, flag, tasks and then execute test, and then I am forcing Gradle to rerun everything that test depends on. So it's going to re-execute the whole compilation, test execution, etc., etc. So you can force it to re-execute if you really need to. But in general, this is something that you really want to avoid. Every time you see rerun test, this is something that you need to avoid. So let's interrupt this. You also mentioned something like continuous mode, yep. I guess. So before I go, I have an alias. I'm lazy, so I'm using GW for Gradle wrap. So again, if I run this, this is really what this command is really doing is checking if I'm using the right Gradle version and it's going to download it if I don't, right? If I don't have it locally. And then I have this alias. So let's do uh, minus t compile java. Now you can see that the command line is actually waiting for something to happen. And if I go to my ID and change some sources there, let's break something. No, let's not break. I don't like to break. Hello. If I come back there, then Gradle monitored the files and it's actually running the task in the background. So it recognized that one file has changed and then automatically recompiles. And this is pretty smart what it is doing there. So we're going to mention later how you configure the tasks. This is not blindly monitoring all your project subdirectories and as soon as something changes, rebuilds. It is only rebuilding what matters. So if I don't change something that is needed by Compile Java, so say I change a test file. Again, I'm going to do something here. Asset through, through. And if I go back there, actually it's not running anything. Because what I modified is a test file, 
And what I'm running is compiled Java, so I'm not running compiling the test classes. So it's not doing anything. Control D, and then I'm exiting the, um, the uh, continuous mode. So one thing to mention is that if you use the continuous mode, you don't have build scans. This is the only exception right now. So uh, we don't monitor all the builds that you could run with um, this uh, continuous mode, because this potentially you could have I don't know, thousands of builds a day. Um, yeah, this was a design decision mainly. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yep. Oh, the that's one thing the one thing you didn't show though um, is that so the, the if you're really really lazy that Gradle W minus T compile Java or oh, dash yeah. dash continuous compile Java. <laughs> okay, so you want get, to show this? Yeah. So you can camel case reference the Gradle tasks. So effectively, the tasks have a name, and the moment you've got a unique camel casing, uh, you may have to add a couple extra letters in case there are similarly similar uh, similarly named tasks. But that, that's yeah. so. Yeah, let's give a, a better example when you want to be lazy. So imagine I want to just execute this task. I can just run Gradle. K D A R, and it's running the report. So <laughs> this camel case is actually something I use every day, so I almost forget I do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just r really convenient. Okay, and so <sighs> that's pretty much it for what we wanted to convey as a. Gradle build user. Um, with that, um, you should no longer be scared of Gradle. Of course, it's different from Maven. Of course, it's different from Ant. It's, it's a different tool. And there are some design decisions that make it different. But you no longer need to be scared. Um, what we're going to do next is go into the construction guide. And maybe a quick question we could have is, would you rather have a longer break that we do somewhere later? Or this could be also a nice moment if you need 10 minutes to go to the toilet, get another coffee or something like that. This one? <laughs> we have one vote for two breaks. Okay. Yeah? Let's do that. Okay, let's do so that. So see you in 10 minutes. So it's, it's nearly 10.30, so 10.40 at the latest, we're starting yeah. again. And we're starting without you, if not then. Yeah. <laughs> but we count on you to be back, right? Oh. Now we're going to talk about plugins a bit. So Gradle is built upon plugins. And this is not different from what Maven does. This is not different from um, the, the convention approach of Maven. But the, the way we build plugins is a bit different. So often we hear the, 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 the comment that Gradle doesn't have a life cycle. Actually, we made it clear that this is not true. We do have life cycle. And uh, I wrote a blog post a few weeks ago, actually, if you're interested in I could paste the link later, and uh, explain why Gradle does have a life cycle. And we have those tasks, we have assemble, we have build, we have clean, and all those tasks come from somewhere. And this somewhere is a plugin. So the very basic plugin that we have is called the base plugin. And this plugin will add tasks and add some conventions and provide some build structure. And typically the base plugin is the one that is adding this clean task. So I know that the Maven users are really fond of using clean. For good reasons, because otherwise most of the cases the multi-project builds are broken. In Gradle, clean is not that important and we'll explain later why. In most cases, you never have to run clean again in your life. But those tasks are provided by the base plugin. And typically what it does is adding something that we call the configurations. And configurations are really a bad name for something extremely simple. Configurations is inherited from uh, Ivy. I don't know how many of you know about Ivy, but that's a a side project of N that came just to handle uh, dependency management 
with Ant mostly, and then it was adopted by different projects. And actually, Gradle in its early days was based on Ivy, and then we built our own engine. But still, we have some names inherited from that era, and configuration is one of them. And configuration is just a set of things, and those things can be files. And typically, if a project publishes something, you actually publish it to a configuration. So archives is one of them. And if you call upload archives, it's actually going to upload the files found in this configuration. It also applies some base conventions. So you can change uh, the, the archive base name. So uh, yeah, this is just really simple configuration of uh, what the, the file, the, the jar file would be typically. Um, if you have a distribution, so if it's an application, you most likely you want to ship it as a zip or a tarball or whatever. So you have a distribution directory and you can tweak that. Uh, the libs directory is also something that you can find in lots of projects. So this is where the jars of the dependencies would be uh, pushed in. And uh, this is actually also where uh, for multi-project build, every project would produce those jar files in this libs directory and provides yeah so this is exactly the same it provides also something which can be confusing sometimes especially if you use the groovy dsl so the version property uh, because this one is also uh, very frequently shadowed <laughs> so be aware that if you use version in a in a in a project and you have uh, the groovy dsl sometimes uh, the version that you can get is not the one from the base plugin, but can be the one from the project property itself. So, anyway, that's not uh, super important there. Uh, base name. But what I really want to mention is that the way Gradle builds plugin is different because it imposes a hierarchy of plugins. So we're talking about conventions and we're talking about plugins and actually all of them build upon something. So if I use the Java base plugin, this plugin is applying the base plugin because it wants to inherit from the uh, archive configuration. It wants to have the clean task. It wants to have it wants to, to have a, a common ground to build Java projects. It just one example, um, what happens if you start a new Gradle project from scratch, like just creating a settings.gradle.kts or not, and a build.gradle.kts or not, and you've got empty files, that's good enough to run Gradle. Um, you still need a wrapper to use the, rep yes. the wrapper, but if you've got Gradle installed, that's good enough. And if you run Gradle clean on that, it will fail, telling you there is no clean task. Um, the assemble, the build, and the check we discussed earlier, they're exactly in that, base in that base plugin as well. So you don't have them if you at least do not have a minimum level of plugins applied. Yes. And there is a goal behind that. The goal is that you could use Gradle not for building a Java project, but for doing something completely different in another ecosystem. And maybe these defaults make no sense. And so you would grow a different set of plugins. At the same time, if the base plugin makes sense and the stuff we'll see in Java base don't, well, at least you know you can depend on base plugin without having to bring in Java base. So that's, there is also a design behind that separation between the different plugins and what they bring. Exactly. So the base Java plugin is basically something around the Java compiler. So it will explain to Gradle what it is to build a Java project, right? But when we say Java project, I'm not saying a Java project with the Maven conventions. Not yet. I'm just saying, how can I build a Java project? So how do I call the Java compiler? What is a compiled Java task, etc., etc. And what it does is adding some model elements to configure those tasks and create those tasks. And it adds a concept which is really important that is going to be demonstrated with we later, the concept of source set. So it will add a source set as a concept in Gradle. And this is, I'm really insisting on this one because often we hear that Gradle is not 
model. <laughs> this is exactly the opposite. It is extremely strongly modeled. And it is modeled around this source set for Java. And it is modeled uh, around software in general. So what we do is that we have plugins that model software. So to give you an example, a very good example is that when we started Gradle, Android didn't exist, right? There wasn't any Android build out there. But still, Java was there, so we created the Java plugin and Java base plugin. The Java base plugin was there to compile Java tasks. And then Android came and said, hey, actually, I need to compile Java too. So I'm going to base myself on the Java plugin because there are some conventions there that I can use. But actually, in the Android world, the way you structure the file is different. So the conventions are going to be different. So when we talk about conventions, those are based in the different plugins and defined in the different plugins. So the Java base plugin is not really defining any convention at all. It is just defining the tool set that we need to build Java applications. And the source set is one. So what is a source set? A source set is just something that is an input to the compile task. And this input is just a set of source files. So it could be Java, Ruby, Scala, it doesn't really matter. We have sources. You can have resource files, and a source set also has an output. And because Gradle is incremental, knowing about the inputs and the outputs is extremely important. So when we talk about Java, we know that we have things called compile class path, runtime class path, things like that. So those are also concepts that are bound to the source sets. And then we have tasks to process those input files and maybe output files if you need to. So when I defined base Java plugin, actually I didn't define any convention. It's just how they compile a Java task, a uh, uh, Java source set. Well, the only thing I have is a compiled Java task, but it's not created yet. What is going to create a compiled Java task is if I apply the Java plugin. And this one is the one that you will most likely manipulate. You don't manipulate the base plugin as a user. You don't use the Java base plugin as a user. You use higher level abstractions. You use the Java plugin or the Java library plugin. And those ones are modeling something which is more important for you as a developer because it is modeling your application. So we have now two plugins for Java. One is called the Java plugin. And one is called the Java library plugin, but basically the Java plugin adds and creates those tasks to compile the Java sources. So it also needs to do that based on some conventions. And we didn't decide to go with our own convention. It wouldn't really make sense. So we reused the convention that existed in the Maven ecosystem back then. So if you apply the Java plugin, what it does is actually create source sets for main and test sources. And from the source sets, we're going to create tasks. But it's really the Java plugin that does that, right? So the conventions are based in the Java plugin. Then it adds this configuration thing. And the configuration, again, is where you would declare your dependencies. So if you used to Maven, you know that you have dependency scopes, compile, runtime. The same concepts exist in Gradle, but it's called configurations. So you assign a dependency to a configuration. So you would assign a dependency to an API or implementation configuration. So by default, and again, some sets themselves are built on top of different conventions. You have source sets based on the name of the source set. So if you use the Java plugin, it would be source main Java, because we create a source set main, and the language is Java. For resources, it is exactly the same. And then we derive the name of the compile tasks based on the source sets. So if you have a main source set, then we will derive something which is compile main Java. Oops, that's an exception. Actually, because it's called main, we just drop name here, and it's just going to be compile Java. This is just a historical convention. I'm not sure it was a good idea, in the, a good design decision, but 
you have compiled Java, which is equivalent to compiled main Java, and if you run compiled main Java, it wouldn't actually do anything, because distance doesn't exist. But if you do compile test Java, it is going to compile the test source set. Does it make sense? Okay. So, we're talking about configurations, and we're talking about source sets, and now we have two different things to mention. We know that we have the runtime class path, compile class path, and actually we need to make the difference between dependencies that you need to compile and dependencies that you need only at runtime. So for that, you have different f configurations, and again, it's going to be uh, based on the name of the source sets. But we're going to come back later to this. So for main, yeah, I mentioned that. It is, um, the, the, the main uh, prefix is actually ignored, so what you could get is different configurations and a compiled Java task. But now, we're going to talk about another level of plugin. And this one is the Java library plugin. And we're starting to have the big difference between uh, Gradle and Maven in terms of modeling. So basically what you have in Maven is uh, a type in the pom file that tells you it's a war, it's a jar, it's a whatever. And that's all. It doesn't really change anything in the build process based on what you said there. In Gradle, the plugin tells you what you're building. So if I apply the Java library plugin, I'm explaining to Gradle, this is not a random Java product that I'm building. I'm actually building a Java library project. So this is a library, so this means that this is consumed by someone else. This is something that is going to produce a jar, but this jar is not going to live as an application. It's going to live as a library that is going to be a dependency of different projects. And because it has consumers, it has an API. And if we were to stop there, you could say, oh, come on guys, you're just having fun, right? What's the difference between Java and Java library? But that's exactly what we're covering now, is there is a big difference there. And the difference matters, again, performance. Good modeling, but performance as well. So that's, these are the two yep. important aspects. So the, interestingly, the, the, the two are bound together. Because a model correctly, actually performance gets better because you, we can do smarter things. So, let's talk about Java libraries a bit. So, it adds extra configurations. And why? Because if you have a Java library, it means that you have consumers, so it means that you have an API. So consumers are going to call this API, but they shouldn't see the implementation details, right? As a consumer, the implementation details, you don't care. So it means that you don't want to leak some dependencies to the consumers when they compile themselves. So you declare the API dependencies and then you declare the runtime dependencies and the implementation dependencies d differently. So what it means in practice is that we have this... Is it scary? It's not really. This is a graph of the configurations. Again, this word in Gradle if you apply the Java library. And what it says is really simple, is that I have an API and I can assign dependencies to the API, so every dependency that I put as an API dependency is going to be needed by the consumers. And then I have implementation dependencies. And what is an implementation dependency? This is something that I need internally as an implementation detail. I could change it tomorrow it shouldn't leak to the consumers that I changed an internal dependency, right? So this is something that often we see in project in Java projects, and it's really a nightmare to handle, actually. So you have, say, a dependency on Guava. Everybody has a dependency on Guava at some point. And you decide that, yeah, but now I move to Java 8. Well, we just started moving to Java 8. Don't, <laughs> don't blame us. <laughs> So, and say, okay, actually, most of the things that we're using from Guava, I don't need them anymore because I can replace that with the stream API, whatever. Okay? So, I want to change this Guava dependency and uh, maybe drop it. But the problem is, if you added this dependency as an API dependency instead of an implementation dependency, 
then it means that the consumer could have started using Guava accidentally because it was available on ClassPass. So when they compiled, actually Guava was there, but it shouldn't be because it wasn't exposed in any of the public methods that you use. So you just accidentally leaked a dependency that was internal and it makes the evolution of your software much harder. So we model that differently and say, okay, you have the API and maybe there you have some external dependencies that need to be published to the consumers because it is part of the contracts and some dependencies are not. And then you can have runtime only dependencies. So typically, I don't know, a JDBC server, uh, JDBC library, uh, you don't need that at compile time, you only need that when you execute the code. And, and so to, to go back to that graph, um, Maven has a way of modeling that. You've got the compile versus runtime. But that's, you're expressing what happens for your project. And that information, whatever you put in compile, ends up being a transitive dependencies, both at compile and runtime for your consumers. And that's the goal of this modeling, is to break that. And say, you've got two different things. One is, what do I do when I'm compiling myself? And what others need when they're compiling and using me? Um, the graph is color-coded, so as a user, you should be concerned about API implementation and runtime only. A couple of things could go in compile only. That's where, for example, you could put some of the uh, fine bugs um, annotations uh, processor, uh, sorry, annotation uh, jars, because you don't need them after compile. Um, so that's 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 a bit the thing. The 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 pink ones are what's produced. Knowing that is actually useful when you start writing Gradle plugins. We're not there yet, so. It's well documented. And the compile class pass and the runtime class pass, that's clearly what's used whenever you're compiling or whenever you're executing. And the fact that they're different, again, matters. And, and you see the, the, the arrows that link the boxes, which is effectively saying anything you've declared on compile will end up in the runtime class path because the runtime class pass extends implementation, which extends API. And so it means it takes all the things you've declared. And so in a project, you will see API implementation and runtime being used in the dependency block. Yes. So just as a hint of what Gradle is capable of doing, this graph may sound a bit more complex than it should be. Especially, you could say, why don't I declare something directly on compile class path or runtime class path configuration? Say, I just add a dependency to runtime class path. You should not. You should not because there is an inheritance of configuration, so you can have different configurations inheriting from each other. But Gradle is also capable of doing something really smart, which we call var variant-aware dependency management. And the idea is that you can have multiple compact class paths, multiple runtime class paths, based on the consumers. And those of you who do Android builds are actually using that without knowing. This is exactly what it is. If you have API implementation dependencies, what you declare there is actually dependencies on some libraries. And then the Android plugin is doing something really smart because it is changing the dependency graph based on the variant you are building. And if we simplify that, it means potentially I could say, in API, just give me Guava. This is all I need. And then when we resolve the compile class pass configuration, we would select the most interesting version of Grava for you. And if you build on Java 8, it's going to select the Java 8 version. If you build on Java 11, it would select a version that is smarter for Java 11. This is the kind of things that you can do with Gradle. We're not going to dig into this today because it is, as I said, a, a presentation of itself. So now, uh, Louis is going to demonstrate something around the source sets to show you why it is interesting as a concept. So, th th that's one of the classical questions. Like, you, you start with the Java or the Java library plugins, and you've got the main and the test source set. And quickly, you end up saying, yeah, but you know, I've got different kind of tests. Um, and while you can configure the task, you've got like patterns saying, oh, all these 
ending in test are to be considered unit test. All these ending in IT are going to be considered integration test. And I'm running them as different bits. Um, it, it's not the right modeling. The, the first thing is it means you're going to compile your integration test when you want to run the normal test and vice versa. And that's time lost again. So why don't we have a plugin for integration test and a plugin for? Well, the first reason is where do we stop? Like, your integration test might not be my project's integration test. I may have performance tests. You don't. Um, and even if I have performance tests and you have performance tests, do, do they get built and wired the same? Do they end up using the same kind of dependencies and everything? So really, we don't have that. And one of the main reasons is because it, it's, it's really easy. Once you understand and know how to do it, it's really easy to do. Um, and, and of course, what I'm showing here is I'm doing it manually for a given project. But in your organization, if that's something that matters, then you will want to extract that into a specific plugin for your organization so that it can be applied. And again, we'll discuss about how that happens um, later on. So I've got an absolutely thrilling application um, that has a great domain. Well, that's not what I wanted. That has a great domain which is a project class that has a name and it logs something saying I've created a project name. So pretty much if I look into my Gradle build right now, I got a plugin, the Java plugin applied. Um, it's a Gradle KTS, so we're going to use the Kotlin DSL. Um, I'm saying that I'm using the JCenter repository. And I already have a couple of dependencies which allowed me to write that wonderful project class. Uh, one is on the implementation level, I'm using SLF4J API. That's what allows me to access that logger. Um, and at runtime, well, you know, the usual SLF4J message about no depend, like no um, binding. No binding found that, so I resolve it. It's just runtime. I mean, I don't need it for compiling or anything. It's just when I execute my code, I want that to be on the runtime class path. So the first thing we said is let's go and add source sets. So I'm going to create that source sets. And the way I'm creating it with the uh, Kotlin DSL is like that. And we're going to have slow tests. OK? So immediately, just by doing that, if I go here on the command line and do gwdep, because I'm lazy, so I'm launching the dependencies task. So that's analyzing all the configurations of my project and showing me all the dependencies that these configurations have. And if I scroll up, you'll see a number of like slow test annotation processor, slow test compile, slow test compile class path, slow test compile only. That's what we mean by the modeling. Like Cedric explained, that the moment you add a source set, you get extra configuration. Here they are. So with that done, um, nope, that's not the one I want. With that done, we can go back here and say, OK, I got my slow test. Let me then create a new directory. And that new directory is going to be slow test slash Java. <laughs> oh, not Java. Not Java. Java. <laughs> there we go. And now, because you need to I'm in auto import, it should do it. magically, but it doesn't want to. So if I re-import my project in Gradle, you'll immediately notice that slow test properly became a source folder. So I can now in here create a Java class. And it's going to be slow test, slow project test. Yeah, I don't need it in Git. I just need it there. OK. And so with that class, well, uh, I want a dependency, right? I'm going to use JUnit, simple enough. So let's go back to the build source. And here, well, what we want is to use the um, added configuration. Now. The benefit of the Kotlin DSL is you get great completion in the IDE. One of the downside is you lose some of the magic 
groovy uh, dynamic thingies. And one of them is, for example, um, when the plugin Java was applied, the Kotlin DSL was able to say, oh, they're applying the Java plugin so I can generate accessors to the implementation and the runtime configuration in the dependencies block. But here, it's a configuration that's created by my source set declaration, so I have to access it by name, and it just means that I have to put quotes around it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use slow test implementation, and then saying, here we go, we're going to need to unit 412, okay? And so if I go back here, no, not here, there, and again run my Gradle W dependencies, I can immediately see that effectively is the slow test compile class pass, gain JUnit and Hamcrest core. The slow test implementation is about JUnit. Um, it's not resolved because that's not a configuration Gradle will resolve, so it just gives you the declared dependencies. And again, the slow test runtime class path, as you've seen with the inheritance graph, properly inherits JUnit. So just a parenthesis regarding the Kotlin DSL. So if this source set creation was done in a plugin, and a build yeah. source plugin in particular, you would have the completion available. So we really encourage you to do that in a plugin rather than directly in the build script. So if that's beyond yeah. the scope. So effectively, if I was able here to say import my slow test plugin, I could get rid of the double quotes here because there would be an accessor generated. So now let's go back to our wonderful test class and we'll understand quickly why it's a slow. Okay, so I've got my test here. Is it slow typing or slow testing? Why well, it's both, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it's because I don't have the crappy keyboard <laughs> yes. you mocked earlier on. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's slow because clearly we have to do that, right? Because what's, what's a good test if it doesn't have a thread.sleep? No, that, that would be too long. <laughs> um, Try catch, it's not groovy. No, we're just gonna throw the exception, who cares? Hmm. And then what we're doing is creating the project and we said the project takes a name. Um, I forgot to add a package. Whatever, that's gonna work still. Um, and here, wait a sec. You know what, let me still do that. Ah, oh, come on. Sorry, wrong. You need to change the destination package. Yeah. Just move. F6. It's F6. Oh no, don't move it there. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> My bad. So you want... No, you need to select it. It only shows the ones that you have used. Go here. Yes. Sorry. I should have done that when creating the... Yeah, continue. Trust me. So, here we are. We're in the same package or sample that my main code, but it still can't find it. What's happening? Well, what's happening is that I've declared my source set, but I didn't say anything about its relationship to my main code. So what I need to do is go back here and actually configure that a bit more. And the way I'm going to configure it is by specifying that the compile class path. <laughs> you shouldn't have activated all okay, the so it's, it's So usually we say if you use the Kotlin is whatever the native oh, import in the ID. Don't enable this uh, checkbox that says uh, in auto import or whatever. Yeah, I think it's auto import because yeah, if mean, you have a, a a broken build file, basically breaks everything. So, this so is not there. something that I've, you want to I've do. disabled it. <laughs> 
So I can specify my compile class path, and what happens is that the compile class path is already wired with the configuration, but it doesn't say anything with, towards its relationship with the main. And so what I want is I want to say that my compile class path should be extended with the main output. So that means I want to have what's produced by main be part of the class path of my um, testing. And so if I no go here, import changes. Well, that should work now. No, you should do import. It you doesn't, it's, import. it's in the same package. No, you, d you didn't oh. synchronize the product. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, Negative. no, it works, right? No, my test compiles. So let's have my project here, and then I can assert that my project dot get name is slow project. Come on. There we go. Okay, so we're all good. And I'm in a nice ID. IntelliJ tells me I can run that. So let's run it. Is it going to work or not? <laughs> it's not. Why? Well, it's because I've informed. Damn, I can't make that bigger. How do you do that? No, you need to. <laughs> I'm lost with the trackpad. No, no, my trackpad is, uh, is dead. <laughs> so I'm getting class not found exception um, for the org sla 4 logger factory. What's happening is that in my source set here, I'm missing something. And what I'm missing is I'm missing the dependencies declaration for the slow test. But thinking about it, I'm really not interested in duplicating all of these. So what I'm going to have to do is instead work at the configuration level and indicate that for the, um, and again, I have to do that like that, the slow test implementation. Without an S. Slow test Whoops. implementation. Should extend. Should extend from. Hey, go away. Um, configurations dot main. Dot. No. Is it going to be annoying like that? It's not main. It's configuration dot compile like that. Uh, sorry, that's the source set. Yeah, yeah, that's wh that's why it was. Uh, implementation, sorry. Yeah. And so here you need that weird accessor, but that's what, that's what you need. So I want my slow test implementation dependencies to be an extended set of the configurations implementation. And I need to do something similar for my slow test runtime. And again here, it's an extends from. configurations.runtime.get. So that's, that's what I need. So with that, if I import my changes, go back to my test, and run it again. And is it going to work? Yes, it is. So now we've got pretty much everything we needed. However, for the sake of completeness, I would need to be sure that I'm properly... Um, actually, you know, that's good. So I've shown it inside the ID. So no, that's working inside the ID. We're all good. But what's the task I run on the command line? I mean, I, I need a specific task for that. So um, I got stuff in the ID, but I need a, the right thing uh, to run that on the command line. And so here, again, my slow test declaration did not do anything about 
a task. So what I'm going to have to do is create a test task, which is going to be named slow test. Again, that name is just me reusing similar conventions as to what's happening with regular um, um, Java plugin applications. And that's pretty much it. Well, let's try. So here, GW and ST, because I'm lazy. And, well, that's weird. Let's look at that. You didn't bind it. Ah, there we go. No source. What? That makes no sense. So... It does. But actually, exactly, it does. So the problem is I've defined that task, but I haven't said anything about where its sources are. And like I've said, the fact that I named it slow test is me keeping the convention of what I'm building, but nothing has told Gradle where that test thing needs to be. So I need to specify the class path of that. And the class path is going to be my slow test source set runtime class pass. So source set, slow test, runtime class path. And I need one more thing. The one more thing I need is I need to specify, sorry, the test classes directory. So where do we find the tests to be executed. And once again, this is, let me do, once again, this is coming from the source sets, slow test, but it's the property we discussed, right? It's the output of that guy. And if I now go back to my command line and I effectively execute my Gradle W slow test task, I've got a wonderful Error. Class not found. Mm, what did you miss? So what happens there? Well, it happens that Gradle is way stricter than the IDE. And the missing bit that I nearly... Forgot. For, well, not forgot, <laughs> but like said a bit too early, is that I specified my compile class path for the slow test source set. But we've seen that we've got a strict separation between compile and runtime. So I also need to say that for the runtime class path of that guy here, I want as well my source set's main output. So yes, there is a bit of wiring, but that's pretty much everything you need to do that extra concept of tests. And the way we've articulated it is we've completely decoupled it from the test implementation and the test runtime. But it could very well be that I end up using the same test libraries. And so instead of just extending uh, implementation and runtime, I could ex extend test implementation and test runtime. And so, no, it works. That's it. Yeah, it's yay because, I mean, <laughs> the demo completely messed up at DevOx France, so at least here it's working. Uh, showed we've worked a bit on it. Um, but, but clearly, th that's the rich modeling and getting benefits out of the, the, the Gradle concepts that are in there. Um, that's how you get that thing working. So something we need to mention. We've done that within the build script. Don't do this at home, right? Write a plugin to do that. Yeah. Write a plugin to do the right ring, put it in build source or whatever. But you don't want your build source to your build file to look like that. You want them to be declarative. So this is the wiring, and we do that this way in this session just because we could do that in a plugin, but it would take a bit more setup, and we didn't introduce how to do that yet. So you can do that in the build script, but it, it is much better to do it in a proper plugin. Yeah, and, and doing it in the build script has the main benefit also that you're discovering it as it goes. Yes. 
And then when you extract it in a plugin, it's like, okay, you've shown that it was working, and now you're making it shareable with others. So that means plugins are really important in the Gradle world. And um, the way you can interact and look, and look up uh, Gradle plugins is by going to the Gradle uh, plugin portal. Um, most of the plugins that are out there um, are designed for interacting with a specific technology, um, setting up a specific environment, Docker interactions, um, ASCII Doctor. Um, I think we recently somebody like Cordem plugin, it's a set of plugins that are even more opinionated than the Java plugins. So effectively they give you a Java project, but that, that is configured for deployment to a remote artifactory, um, binary server like Artifactory or Nexus. I mean, and really tons of plugins out there and also like effectively finding again some of the uh, similar integrations with other tools that you find in the Maven world. So pretty useful. When you start, I mean, with what we've seen today, we're still lacking the how. We've showed you the modeling, we've tried to explain the why, but how does that all work internally? And when you start interacting with a build, and fun, not interacting, authoring a build, at some point it really becomes important to understand that, because it then helps you a lot with improving your build. Um, I mean, during the break, one of the questions we had is, okay, we're looking at being better parallel, or whenever I even run help on my build, it takes more than 10 seconds. These are typical issues that knowing the how internally, or at least having a, maybe, even if it's simplified, but having a model of the way it works really matters. So, the Maven lifecycle is about how you build your project. In Gradle, we call that convention tasks. But Gradle itself has a real life, has a real life cycle when you execute Gradle. It starts by the configuration phase. And the configuration phase is really about discovering your project. Evaluating the build scripts. If you've got a typo or an invalid reference, that's where it will fail. It also starts building the model and wiring the different bits together. It does not execute it, or it should not execute any of your code at that point. Then it's going to build the task graph, because that's what needs to run. When all of that is done, and here we're talking about sub one second time. If you're bigger than that, you've got a configuration phase performance problem. It means you're doing too much work at configuration time. Something you've written or some plugin you're using, because I mean, with using lots of plugins, that's one of the downsides. Sometimes the bad practices are not coming from your build, they're sadly in a plugin. But you can report that, help the, I mean, have the plugin author try to fix that kind of issues. It, it's really important. The configuration phase should be really, really speedy. Then comes the execution. So that's where Gradle finally does the stuff it needs to do for your project. It runs the tasks that are required by the build invocation in a reverse order, right? If you wanted to run test, we will start compiling first and then walk, walk the graph up to the point we can say, yep, we've done all the dependencies of the test task, we're finally ready to build that test uh, task. And we believe it's important enough that we show you the basic issues when you write tasks that can happen, and so Cedric is gonna switch back to a demo. Good to go? Yes. Oops. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm not switching to you yet? Yeah, you can switch. I was trying to download the RC2, but I didn't have <laughs> enough time. So. <laughs> so I have an empty project there, and what I'm going to do is just to create uh, an empty Gradle project. So um, let's say Gradle wrapper, or, or Gradle init. Let's say Gradle init. What does it say? 
Yeah, that's something we haven't talked about, but Griddle has a way of generating projects for you. It can even do a basic translation of a Maven project. Uh, it's an area that probably needs a bit more um, investment and development, but it can do basic things, and so that's what Cedric just did. Yes, so I, I just created a Gradle in it, and it created a simple project, and what I can see is that the last time I did upgrade my Gradle local install, actually the one that works on the command line path, was on Gradle 481, so it's pretty old, well, a few weeks ago. Anyway, that's not important there. What it creates is just a single skeleton of a Gradle project, and it has a build file. And uh, I could use the Kotlin DSL2. It's just an option to add in the Gradle in it. But because it's groovy and I like groovy, let's go groovy. So, OK, so uh, let's do something like, I don't know, create a task. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, hello world, right? Hello. OK. So. I'm going to write it the way you would da do that in Kotlin. It's actually exactly the same. <laughs> so let's register a task called hello. And then I'm going to say print line hello devox, which is super nice. And now if I do Gradle tasks, oops, let's not do that. Radial tasks, oops. Oh, that's not the right syntax. What did I do wrong? Create instead of register. No, it's, it, it should be register. <laughs> Let's go create. That's the lazy API. I was trying to use the lazy API. Oh, okay. Anyway, so we created a task, and then boom, it's not visible in the task list. Why? Oh, actually, I didn't put any description to my task. So if I go and edit my file and Add the description. I say description equals say hello. And then if I run Gradle task again, I don't see it. Why? Where is it? Oh, it needs a group, I guess. Yeah. Group test. Here it is. So I have my task with the description. So it's always nice to have a description to the tasks. But I don't know if you noticed, but every time I have executed task, actually something was printed on the command line. Have you noticed that? So it's, it was always actually doing this. Hello, devox. Every time I do that. Every time I invoke Gradle, if I just do Gradle, it's printing hello devox. This is probably not what you want, right? You want to do that if you actually run the task, not every time. So this is the mistake that you need to avoid when you create custom tasks in Gradle. You have to be aware that when you write something here, this is executed at configuration time. So this is executed. We lost three, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So this is executed when the configuration happens. So we explain that there are two phases, two, well, not more phases, but two main phases, configuration and execution. During the configuration, the only thing that you want to do is configure the tasks that you're going to execute, but not execute them right now, because otherwise you would execute code for tasks that you would never execute. So what you need there is to add something here called do last. And what is in the do last block here is going to be what the task actually does. So when it is executed. So if I do Gradle again, it doesn't print this hello message anymore. The only way I can have to show it now is to actually call the hello task and do Gradle hello and now hello devos is printed. So this is just the simple illustration of the different configuration phase and execution phases. This is super important because we had the question at the break earlier. Almost every time you see a configuration phase that is multiple seconds, 
This is probably exactly what is going on. Something is done during the configuration time that should not be done during configuration. It should be done when you execute the task, not when you configure it. Right. And so, of course, here the usage of the do last is just an example. Yep. Um, when you write a real task, class-based and everything, um, you'll have a difference between what happens in the constructor and what happens in, in the execute method of the task. So it seems clearer, but that's one of the mistakes you'll do when you're prototyping with Gravel. And so think about that. Um, and again, if you have custom tasks, it's always better to create them in a plugin. But yeah, we'll come to that. OK, that's, that's it. it. Yep. Yep. So effectively, summing up what we just demonstrated, you want to do the minimum during configuration. Because Gradle doesn't, at that point, doesn't know what test or deploy or upload to whatever or Docker push something. It doesn't know what it means for your project. And so it must go over all of the build files, over all of the tasks to get them, to get them in the graph so that it finally can compute what's needed, what's not. And so it means that if you've got a, just instead of a hello world, you're parsing a multi gigabyte archive, well, it will happen every single time. So again, continuing on that topic, what does that mean then when a Gradle project is being asked to execute the compile task? And the way the, we're insisting on that because it's one more way to go over the concepts there. So the tasks are really the building blocks of Gradle. That's where work happens. Um, we've seen that the do last is a way of adding execution to a task. Um, there is also a do first that allows you potentially to customize some of the tasks. So you could imagine the naive way of having integration tests talking to a server could be that you do first, start the server, execute the test, do last, do something, except that there is an issue with that because if the test fail, you won't get the do last executed. So Gradle has other concepts for that, but that's an illustration of, the, of why these APIs are in there. Um, of course, when you define your own task type, or when you use a task type, Usually, they will provide configuration. That's what we've seen with these class path or test classes there um, in, the, in the slow test um, demo earlier. Um, and the action itself, well, it's defined by the type. And so here, for a Java compile, it's going to execute compilation. But compilation of what? Well, we've seen it, right, with the test task. If you don't configure it, test of nothing, compilation of nothing, you have to do some configuration. So just uh, yeah, as, a, as a comment, so everything is strongly typed in Gradle. So it doesn't matter that you use the Kotlin DSL, the Groovy DSL, everything is strongly typed. So you have this Java Compile reference for those who are not familiar with, the, with Groovy, this is a class literal. So in Java, it would be javacompile.class. In Kotlin, it would be uh, semicolon, semicolon, class.java. So yeah. this is really a class literal, so this is strongly typed. Sorry. No, no, colon, colon, yeah, for, for the Kotlin thing. Colon, yeah. Colon, colon, class, if the receiver understands Kotlin classes, and you've got the dot .java if you need the, Java, the equivalent of the Java dot .class. So what, what then does compile do? Well, compile is all about transforming your source files into uh, compiled ones. So it means we have a number of inputs going in there. We've got the Java source files, but that's not it. We also have the source encoding, the compile options, and the whole class path. Because that's really what matters when you're compiling. And similarly, we've got outputs. And the outputs are, for a compile task, the class files. So talking about inputs, outputs is really important because you want to see tasks as a function. Based on a set of inputs, you produce some output. And ideally, the task you write will produce the same output with the same input. 
That's what allows Gradle, when Cédric showed the interaction with the proje project, he ran tests a second time without changing anything, and Gradle decided there is nothing to do. The results are going to be the same. I'm assuming your tests are stable. It's going to be the exact same output. So, of course, we've got the um, inputs origin that matters. For the Java source, well, it's good we've got that source set concept. So we're going to model the compile task in relationship to a source set. Um, we've got the source encoding and the compile options. Well, these belong more at the task level. So I don't want to have to specify which files to grab directly at the compile task level. But the specific encoding and compile options, that makes sense there. And the class path, well, again, instead of Munging everything into a single task configuration that can get gigantic, we're combining these concepts we've seen. And so the dependencies, I declare them on configuration. And then the compile task will use the right configuration, which will inherit from some of the ones I've configured, in order to do my class path. So the word hat, like, we've discussed that configuration, it's a container of dependencies and or produce artifacts. So that's what makes the name a bit not ideal, because it really has multiple roles, and that's not always, um, and it doesn't help, right? Searching for configuration in a build tool documentation is not also something that works well, because we talk about configuring configuration all the time, even when it's not about a Gradle configuration. The and funny thing is that we, we still don't manage to find a good name for that. Yeah, <laughs> so if you've got ideas, just naming things, right? The second artist is caching. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, and and we, you've seen you've seen in the source set uh, demo uh, the role of the extends. Now, of course, nowadays no project exists without dependencies. And what a dependency is, it's a pointer to another piece of software that is required to either build, test, or run your project. And so the way Gradle model that is by tying a dependency to a configuration, and then the configuration has meaning in different concepts. And we've explained some of the Java plugin configurations, the added ones by Java library, and Cedric hinted at the fact that Android has a different model because they've got richer things to, to do. I mean, you can have like the debug version of an application. You can have the free version, the paying version. You can have different runtimes. Uh, and there, there you may need different libraries. Um, I mean, if you start talking also about Android native code, it goes even beyond that. And so, again, we're looking back at stuff we've shown already, but in practice, you've got that configuration declaration. Here it does nothing, right? Because the moment you add the plugin, implementation is created. But if you don't have the Java plugin and you want to call your configuration implementation, that's the way you would declare it. And the moment it exists, it's usable inside a dependencies block, and you can add either binary dependencies or even reference other projects from your multi-project. So just uh, speaking of the project notation, so you see that the project dependency notation is different from Maven. In Maven, you would use the coordinates. In Gradle, you actually say, this is a dependency on this sub-project. And it makes a difference in particular when you consume snapshots. Yeah. So just as a side note. And so, remember, we're in that exercise to understand what compiling means. So we've identified the sources through the source set. We've identified some of the configuration compilation options through the task configuration itself. And now that we know where to go look for the dependencies, we still need to construct the class path. And in order to do that, we will resolve the configuration, which means two things. First of all, resolving the graph of dependencies. So looking at the transitive, um, we'll, we'll have a chapter on dependency management, so we'll discuss that more. But also retrieving the build dependencies effectively so that they can be uh, put on the class path and Java C, because we're doing compile, can be run. And so we build the class path. And that means we've, we've built up an invocation chain. The user has requested compile Java. The build needed the compile class path. So it needs to resolve the implementation configuration. And that's what we're talking about when we're saying we're building the task graph. 
Gradle will arrange all these tasks into an execution graph during the configuration phase. Each task to be executed is a node. We have implicit and explicit relationship between these nodes, okay? And of course, you can't have a cycle. If you've got a cycle, you've got a problem. Like at the task level, you really can't have that cycle. Make sense? Then I think it's time for Cedric to walk us through dependency management. Or mm. we haven't done a second break, so. Five minutes break? Does anyone need five minutes break to run for coffee and things like that? Okay, let's do yeah, that. Let's, five minutes. Well, I can start talking without the slides. It's not yeah, really okay. necessary. So we're going to talk about dependency management. And actually, as I said in the beginning of this session, this deserves a talk of its own. So Gradle has a very powerful dependency management engine. And it is really its own engine. It used to be that it was using Ivy, and it was a long time ago. So if you think that Gradle uses Ivy, this is not real. Actually, what it does is that it supports different kind of dependency management engines, and it supports Ivy, it supports Maven, metadata, etc., etc. And we had to create our own engine because there are lots of problems which are not solved by those different tools, and we needed a way to integrate with more than just those. And when we talk about the native ecosystem, this is typically an example where uh, neither Ivy or Maven would uh, be suitable for us. So when we talk about dependency management, one of the goals for us is to be consistent. And consistent means also that builds needs to be reproducible and uh, reproducible whether uh, you execute them locally or on CI. Uh, something that you need to be aware of is that typically we don't use the uh, .m2 uh, repository by default in Gradle. So you can use it, but you should really not use it for good reasons. So this is typically how you would declare repositories in uh, Gradle. So you have a repositories um, block, and then you say, I'm using Maven Central, I'm using JCenter, I'm using Google. So this is for the Android folks out there. So you declare a set of dependencies, but you need to fetch those dependencies from different repositories. And actually, Gradle supports different kind of repositories, including file. So for some of you, maybe stuck in very old uh, architecture, where the repository is actually a shared network somewhere, this can be supported by Gradle. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but you can do it. And you can even check in dependencies in files in, in, in the VCS if you want to. And how you do that is actually, well, if it's not a pre-known uh, uh, repository, you would declare, actually, this is a Maven repository, this is the URL, or this is an IV repository, or this is a flat tier, and this is where my dependencies are, and I'm not doing any dependency management at all. I'm just using whatever is in the libs file, and done. So you can model this this way. This is perfectly acceptable. It doesn't mean that uh, the modeling is bad. It's just this is the way you get the dependencies. So M2, why you should not use the Maven local? So there is a way in Gradle to use Maven local, so the M2 repository. But you should really not use it for builds. Why? Because whatever is in your local Maven repository means that some project at some point needed that dependency and put that in the cache. And M2 is really a cache of dependencies. It's nothing more than that. So it means that if you checked out a dependency from a project and then you use a different project and add the dependency, but not the repository that it originated from, well, when you build on a different laptop, it wouldn't find that dependency because it wouldn't be in the local M2 repository. So really avoid doing that. Uh, there is one legit use case, which is for Gradle and Maven intero interoperability, sorry. And uh, typically, if you have a project built with Maven and that you have to consume it from Gradle or the other way around, then, well, currently, the only way is actually to publish something into the local repository, the local Maven repository to do that. 
So we've seen that earlier. You can have different ways to add dependencies. If it's a Java library, you would say, hey, actually I have an API dependency on project core, or I have an implementation dependency on this uh, JSON library, or uh, something more interesting and something that we've been working on uh, for the past months is a richer declaration, say something like, actually I prefer this version, but if someone else brings in something else, maybe maybe it's just fine for me. I don't, I don't need something else, I just need something that works. And actually I'm going to explain, well, I need, I need this version of ASM because this is the only one that supports JDK 11. And the reason you put that as a DSL element is that if you have a dependency inside report, you would get this information in the report and it would tell you, I'm using this dependency because of this. So this is useful information for debugging builds. So again, dependency versions, there's a lot to say about them. Uh, you have fixed version, we support ranges, we support snapshots, and ranges and snapshots are a bit special because we need to check the repository from time to time to see if there's a new version available. So by default, it's catch for 24 hours, but you can tweak that. And if you need to refresh it right now, you can just use dash dash refresh dependencies and it would just ignore this uh, 24 hours cache. Uh, always something that we've seen in some builds. Try to avoid saying something like this, so a version number which is fixed and actually saying this module is changing. So you publish something which has a fixed version, but actually you're telling Gradle this version is changing over time. So it means that you're overriding something. So overriding a version. You should really avoid that. There are better integration ways, uh, composite builds, whatever. So avoid doing that. Um, we have some flags also to tweak the behavior of the engine itself. One interesting one is a fail on version conflict. And this one would just tell Gradle, if ever you see two different libraries with the different version number, so one is wanting 1.1, one, one, the other one is wanting 1.1, one, uh, one, whatever, 1.2, uh, it is going to fail because you have to resolve the conflict and you have to choose between the two and you can tweak the timeouts again. So again, Gradle is really good at fixing problems. So whether it's through a small snippet of code like that, or whether it's more declarative using plugins, so especially in the dependency management era, uh, we have um, uh, some plugins like the Netflix Nebula plugins or the Spring Dependency Management plugins, which are pretty advanced and allow a more declarative way to solve problems. Um, but Gradle itself is built to fix the problems that you have in the real world. So I'm seeing two, two versions of the same dependency on the class pass because, I don't know, the group changed and actually there's no way to figure out that it's the same dependency and need to exclude one and not the other, etc, 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 etc. And uh, yeah, this would be typically a rule to say, okay, if you ever see this on the Gradle uh, group, use this version. This is a hammer, right? Say, I don't care what it is, use 1.4. Yep. What? Gradle has tons of, tons of features like that. One of the sad the reason for that is pretty much that we know there is busted metadata for dependencies and their relationship out there. Um, and so this should really be the last resort. What we're hoping to do with Gradle is provide you the tooling so that you can express properly what are really the needs of the dependencies of your project so that when it gets consumed, you're not saying too much, you're not saying too little, you're just saying this is what I've known, what I've tested, these are the flexible points I have in terms of dependencies. And, and then it, but it means also that sometimes on the consuming side, when you're grabbing tons of, like dozens of dependencies, sometimes you end up having conflicts that you have to resolve using some of these techniques. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah, typically some of the problems with Maven is that the only result you have is to use exclude, right? So you're going to use excludes everywhere, but you never know why an exclude is there. And it's even worse because this exclude is published. So it means that consumers 
will inherit from the exclusions. And then you have different paths, someone saying, hey, I need this. The other one says, hey, exclude this. What do I do? Do I need it or not? Tell me. I have no information for that. So actually, Gradle is good at fixing those kind of issues. Yeah, that's all for dependency management today. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, if you're interested in the topics, right, as we've said, we've got a booth, so come talk in details. Um, it's, a, it's just a short like chapter of the presentation today, but it's what keeps us busy most days anyway. So yes. you see the... Uh, um, so the, the next step, fun, the next steps actually, uh, till the end of the presentation are really going to be about, again, one of the key features of Gradle, which is performance. And in order to have performance, um, we need to, we've discussed already inputs, outputs. So we need to understand what's happening. And for that, we need to be able to say that's up to date, or even better, if the state has changed, can we be incremental? So, like I've said, it does matter because Gradle is built for incrementality and laziness, like not doing unnecessary work. Um, clean is really a waste of your time, um, and time is money. If you're working for a company where time is not money and you've got any time you want in the world, I don't believe you're working, actually. But, I mean, nobody has that flexibility. So what's the incrementality test? Well, it's what Cedric showed earlier on. You run a build. You run again with no change. If a task was re-executed, something is wrong. You should fix it. A task is up to date if and only if no inputs have changed and the outputs are still present and untempered. That means you should never have two different tasks pushing their work in the same location. Because if you do that, then obviously the second task running is overriding the output of the first one, or complementing them if you want. But for Gradle, it means they're changing. And so Gradle will not consider the first task up to date ever. So that's the kind of things you need to understand. How do we do change detection? Hashing, right? Hashing of input and outputs. Hashing of the content of these files, of the content of the folders, depending. Serializing some of the properties you're uh, configuring your task with, um, that's pretty much task specific. But effectively, if we go back to the compile task, well, we need a hash of the sources. We need to know if the class path changed. We <coughs> need to know if you change some of the compile options. Um, let me backtrack. The hash of the input, uh, it's more complicated than that for compilation. But let's leave it at that for now. And the same for the class path. So if you want to control that, again, Cedric showed that is an example, you can rerun tasks so that you bypass all the up-to-date checks. And um, also, if you need to understand what's happening with your up-to-date checks, if you add the info uh, level uh, to the logging, you'll see Gradle telling you, well, rerunning that because x. Rerun that task was up-to-date. Rerunning that other one because y. So that's the uh, important thing. So let's take a quick example. Let's say I'm building a shaded jar. So you know, one jar with my code and uh, the code of my dependencies. And I've created a custom task type for that called shaded jar. And effectively, I need the output, the jar file, where I'm going to place the result. Which class path am I using to build that? And some kind of mapping. You know, if I want to hide dependencies I'm consuming so that they don't show up for the consumers of my library, I can do like a mapping from org Apache to shaded.org.apache. And so when I'm writing that shaded jar task, I'm going to declare the input. So I'm going to say, well, the class path, it's a set of input files. The mappings, it's also an input. I'm also going to do the same for the outputs. The jar file is my output file. And of course, when I declare things like that, well, there is a sensitivity to what you're declaring. I mean, if everything was sensitive to the full path, well, everybody in the organization would have to use the same disk-wide organization, so that just doesn't work. So the input files, it's the path or the contents. The class path, it's the contents only, but order sensitive. The compile class path, it's actually the class file contents, limited to the application binary interface. 
So that's one of the reasons that you've got a project, you were using um, library foo11, and then you upgrade to library foo13, and you rerun, and Gradle says, yep, I'm up to date. It just means that the library you change on the class path, you were not using any of the changed binary interfaces. And so compilation has nothing to do. It could completely break at runtime. We all agree with that. But at compilation time, nothing to do. And so Gradle will do nothing. And at input is just the moment the value changes. So knowing why a task is out of date is really important. And that leads us to a demo on that. All right. You're up. So, in this test, actually, I'm, I'm using a very bad name, so I'm using something called sign, it should be a checksum or something like this, or yeah. hash, whatever. This is a, a simple project, and I'm actually using a, a, a plugin written in the build itself, so this is this build source directory, and it has a custom sign task. So imagine that your project manager wants you to compute a hash of all the sources. This is typically how we would configure this task. So you would create a task, and in my case it is of type my sign, and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to configure the sources, and it's going to take the main sources and hash that with a SHA um, algorithm. So if I go on the command line, and I run Gradle, please sign this, it's going to fail because my code is wrong. It should be a map of the sources. Here you go. So it's signing, and the task has been executed. So you can notice that the console is different, but that's a trick I used. So you can switch the, 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 the console output to be more verbose if you want to. And that's just for this demo. So when I run sign, actually you can see that everything is up to date except from the sign task, which is fine because I just started using sign, right? Now, if I run this again, so I'm checking what we said, if I run this again, it should be up to date. If I do this, actually it's saying no, I run that again. And why? I can go to the build scan and it's going to tell me. So I can go to the timeline, explore the sign, and what does it tell me? It tells me the task was not up to date because it did not, it did not have any declared output. Oh, so I forgot to do something actually in my code. So when I created this my sign task, what I did is that, so the task is written in Kotlin, uh, I could write that in Java, in Groovy, doesn't matter. The concept that are, are really the same. So I have my sources, I have an algorithm, I have an output file, file but actually I didn't explain to Gradle what are the inputs and outputs. So I need to tell it, okay, actually sources is a input files collection. This is also an input. And actually, this is an output file, so let's tell this is an output file. So I just declared what are the inputs and what are the outputs of this specific task. And now that I've done that, I can come back to my command line, it's going to execute. So now it's doing more work because it has to recompile the my sign tasks. So it's going to execute again, signing, <coughs> because I have to. But now, if I execute again, what I expect is that because I declared the inputs and outputs, it should be up to date. And it is. Now it's really up to date. And I can execute again, it's going to be up to date. And only if I change the configuration of my task, so say I'm not using SHA anymore, but just MD5, then Gradle is going to be smart enough and tell me, oh, okay, something changed as an input, so I need to re-execute this. And if I go there, in the timeline, go to the sign method, and it's going to say, hey, the value of the input property algorithm has changed. So this is why I needed to re-execute this. 
So actually, build scans are really super powerful for this. They, they can tell you exactly why a task was executed, and then you can optimize your build and make it faster by making sure you declare everything. And as soon as you declare everything, inputs, outputs, then we can do much more. That's it. Yep. So the next step that you can have that, that Gradle knows about is actually processing the changes incrementally. And so here, we're no longer talking about, oh, it's changed. No, we're talking about, oh, that specific thing changed. And then the task can perform the minimal amount of work. So you've got like um, an API for that. So you'll get incremental task inputs instead of uh, what you expected. Or, or I mean, instead of just looking at your inputs, when the task gets invoked, you have a diff effectively of the inputs. And then based on that diff, you can do different things. Like, was that file deleted? Was that file added, changed, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's clearly a more advanced feature. Uh, but just to give you an example, uh, we deemed the uh, incremental Java compiler to be no completely ready, and by default, it's activated uh, Gradle 4.10. 4.9, I think. 4.9. So now you all get incremental Java compilation. Um, that's not yet, for example, available uh, in Groovy or in Kotlin, because that requires different kind of processing. But for, for pure Java projects, so if you just have Java sources, that's fully available uh, from now on. Classical gotcha in incrementality, well, you want that jar to have a timestamp in its manifest, because uh, that gives you an information, or even having like the git commit ID, or things like that. But that means your jar task is pretty much never up to date. Um, and then, what's the solution? You don't necessarily want uh, to drop that information, because it can be useful. But what about only doing it when you actually push out a release, or just have CI do that. But at least on your developer workstation, you're changing things, has nothing to do with that jar, but yeah, a couple seconds elapsed, so it's gonna re regenerate all the jars. I mean, it makes no sense. So that, that's the kind of thing you think about when you're trying to optimize your Gradle builds. Uh, you have to think about the different use cases you have and, and, and yeah, adapt to them. So we've had a couple of questions during the second break about uh, configuration and advanced configuration and what you can do. And, and really, um, Gradle's objective is to give you the power of doing what your build requires. But at the same time, we're very, very much in favor of you going declarative versus imperative. Yes, you can code inside a Gradle build file. Don't do it. Or do it for prototyping. But don't leave it like that. I mean, it's code like the rest. Your, your, the complexity of your application can start in its build. And so if you let the build just go wild, well, it's going to be a mess, just like if you go, let the code go wild. So yeah, you need to maintain that as well. And, but at, at least the expressiveness is here if needed. So balance both and really favor um, declarative over imperative. So how do you do that in Gradle? Well, first of all, you can extend Gradle. Like Gradle has a lot of extension points. Um, you can define properties that, you can, that can then be used to change behavior of different tasks run. Um, you can extend, like add extensions to objects. Um, that, for example, allows built-in domain objects to be extended, including the project, which is the root concept. You can extend that as well. Um, so we're going to go over some of these possibilities um, in the next minutes. So first one is Gradle properties. So first of all, you've got different levels. Uh, pretty much everybody is used now to the end behavior of properties. You know, like if you have the property defined in the end build script, that's its value. But if you define it on the command line, then it's another value. If you define it on an end properties file, then and they can overwrite each other but one always takes precedence. Gradle has a similar um, model here. Um, and of course, the idea is that you've got different use cases. Um, in the Gradle properties of your project, you can define sensible defaults. Like, yes, that project should run in parallel, or here is the usual deploy URL. 
But at the same time, on the command line, you could say, yep, yeah, no, sorry, not running in parallel right now, um, and here is a different deploy URL. You can have properties added to what we call the ext extension container um, on multiple objects, and so that allows you to have, including rich properties as the example here, um, so, for example, we're defining on the project ext, which is what ext references by default if you don't uh, specify it, um, a get revision property. And that get revision property, while well, it's actually the execution of a git command that gives us the git version of what we're running on. And again, don't leave that in the main build file. Put it in the build source inside a plugin, and then just decide to use that plugin. And, and then it's, it stays clean, but there you have it. Or find a plugin that already has that feature, because there are plugins doing that. Extensions are similar, except that they even allow you to customize the DSL. So I'm defining an extension, I'm registering it as a my DSL entry point, um, and then I can access it like that. Um, of course, in the Kotlin way of things, I guess you've got a bit more ceremony to get access to it. Not but if it's in build source. Oh, yeah, right. If it's in build source, again, one more reason for doing it there. Um, I had the questions about that. Um, Gredo also has the concept of configuration rules. And so these are configuration elements that apply to your build based on what else is happening in your build. So, for example, the configurations.all, it will print the name of each and every configuration. The ones that existed before you declared a statement, up to all the ones that are added afterwards by the different plugins in the different projects. And that's what the all does. It says, well, every single configuration will need to pass through me. You've got similar things with the tasks. Um, here, for example, we're saying all the jar tasks, I want a specific destination dir and I want a specific do last. And you can even do that with plugins. And so that's really where you do the plugins composability. You you define your own plugin, but your plugin needs to behave one way if it's based on a Java project, a slightly different way if it's a Scala project, and so you do the composition that way. Now, with all of that, we've touched on, on, on this a bit. Um, you want to model as well the relationship between the tasks. Um, they, and, and the idea is to, as much as possible, use implicit dependencies by, instead of binding the tasks together, showing that this task consumes the outputs of that task, and then Gradle knows that stuff needs to happen. And so that's where you see the jar task obviously consumes the output of the compile Java. And the idea is that this is an information you give when you define the task. And so it allows Gradle to then build the, uh, the graph. Of course, sometimes you need extra relationship and you can be explicit. So here, for example, we're saying, well, I, I wrote a generate code task and I'm explicitly saying that compile Java depends on it. At, this, at the moment, well, the moment you make that task part of a plugin, please do the wiring yourself. Either by configuring, like letting the user configure the task or having some kind of automated mechanism depending on your, on your setup. Okay. Shall we go over yeah. showing a little bit of that? So I'm going to be quick, otherwise we won't have time to show the yeah. cache. So <coughs> this is a simple build file uh, to illustrate this concept of implicit task dependencies. So um, when you define tasks in Gradle, one of the ways to declare dependencies is actually to use this depends on keyword, which is really nice because it adds a dependency on a task. So here I have a plugin that generates some code and Actually, when I compile my Java classes, I have a dependency on the generated code. In the Maven world, you have phases, and there's a phase which is called generate sources, or generate code, and then it applies every time, even if you don't need the generate sources for the task that you're going to execute. In Gradle, you need to be explicit. So you know that if you're going to compile tasks, you have, you compile Java sources, you need the generated sources before. So this is a perfectly correct way to do it. If I run my build, up, uh, build application using this, actually, 
I should probably run with dry run to show you what happens there. So when I execute this build, it's going to generate a code first because I need it for compile Java, which is nice. But there's a better way to model this and a way that is safer both for the plugin authors and for you. If I remove this depends on there, just to show you that I'm not lying and I'm trying to compile this again. Hey, what happens? Yep. If I run this again, let's do clean. Normally you don't have to do clean, but then it doesn't find the devox symbol because the code hasn't been generated. So the dependency is really explicit. So this is nice, but there is a better way to do it. And the better way to do it is actually to say, hmm, actually, the source here, it is not really something that I, yeah, I already tell Gradle this is, this is a source, right? The output directory is a source. So can I avoid telling the dependency explicitly, knowing that Gradle knows that this is actually an output file? And there is a way to do it, which is much better. It's actually this one that I'm going to copy and paste just to be faster. It's just saying, OK, actually, Gradle, just use this source set concept that uh, Louis explained to us exists in Gradle and say, my main source set actually depends on a source set, which is the output of this generate code task. So I just added a source directory, which is a task. This may sound weird if you're not familiar to Gradle, but what it really says is that whatever this task produces is an input for the source set Java main. So now if I do this and run again, it compiles properly and it executes properly the dependencies. And you may wonder why is it better than the other way around. And one of the reasons it's better is that when I declare that on the source set level, if there are plugins that work on the same source set, actually they will also get the dependencies. Because otherwise, what you declare is just your task. My compact Java is going to need that. But if you have, I don't know, CheckStyle or Finebugs that need to execute on this generated code, it wouldn't be executed, and you want it to be executed on the same source set. So it's going to be inherited by everyone. So this is just an illustration of what you can do with Gradle to better model dependencies between project and tasks. OK, so and that's what, I mean, we've shown that, the source set output, right? Both in my sample and in Cyril's thing. So then the idea is, We've said declarative over imperative. Well, the idea is that you need to organize your build scripts. And so the first thing you can do is you can just put some of the code into a different Gradle file and say, apply from that Gradle file. That's the first step. The second step is you go with binary plugins. You implement the plugin interface. Cedric showed an example in Kotlin. He said it can be Java, it can be Groovy, it can even be Scala. I mean, whatever you want, as long as it pro produces bytecode. You bundle that in build source, which is a special sub-project of your build that creates content that is part of the class pass of the Gradle build itself for your project. Um, and of course, that's where you can extend the domain and everything. And so that point about build code management is really important because um, you're going to use these scripts to decompose your build it will enhance the understanding of your project and what it does. Uh, if you use correct naming, right? If it's full bar and buzz for the names of the plugins, it doesn't help a lot. But if you've got meaningful names, then people know what's happening. Um, it modularizes according to the different needs. Encapsulation, enhancing the APIs from Gradle so that you can do more stuff. I mean, really, really, really a key point of Gradle, extensibility to the core. With that, and the couple of minutes we've got left, let's go talk about the build cache. Yeah. So just a comment regarding this. Um, the, yeah, let's go back to the, this slide. So build code management. If you have one takeaway from this session, this is the most important one. So builds are engineering. You wouldn't tolerate bad code. Don't tolerate bad builds. I mean, you can apply the same level, quality levels to your builds than the ones you have for your own code. So do it. So test your builds. 
etc., etc. So the bill cash. So when we talk about bill cash, we are talking about improving productivity at a different scale than just the local one. We productivity at the company scale. And the idea is that because we declared all the inputs, outputs of all tasks, and that you can do that locally, what if you could share that at the company level? So between builds at the CI level. So this is what the bill cache is about. So caching the result of tasks, not just a jar that you produce, but what if you have a task that takes 10 minutes to execute because it produces some complex things and actually it's always the same, so you don't want to reproduce that on all the laptops. Well, you can do that with a bit, um, bill cache. Uh, but we have different scenarios for that. So one is uh, you do a git and you change switch branches often or you do git bisect and then when you bisect you have to do clean because you don't want to have stale outputs or things like that. So you want to make sure everything is safe. And actually most of the code that you change between two commits is exactly the same. So why do you need to recompile everything? It's just wasted time. So you can get that from the cache. Um, something that we're going to demonstrate is the morning scenario. So yep. I'm going to check out in the morning a project and actually if the demo goes well, it's going to be fast. It's going to go well. <laughs> and uh, something we do also at Gradle for our own builds is that we have different uh, CI pipelines and the different pipelines reuse the outputs from different runs uh, of Gradle on different build agents themselves. So we can share the outputs of different build agents um, between the, them using the build cache. And someone was mentioning that. So if you have typically builds running in Docker, and uh, because in Docker you wouldn't use the daemon, it's going to be slow but you can still reuse part of uh, the builds executed in different environments thanks to the build cache. Uh, so there are some prerequisites and the, the only one I'm going to mention is that if your build locally is not incremental, don't expect the build cache to work. You have to declare all your inputs and outputs to do that. And second, this is an opt-in thing, so tasks have to be cacheable and marked as cacheable. Uh, I suggest that we go straight yeah, to the let's demo. Go to the demo. So, in order to go to the demo, I'm going to have to quickly switch the layout here. So, give me just a sec. Uh, where is that? Okay. So that's interesting. Oh, there we go. An issue. So what I've done here is I've effectively configured through the settings that XML, the settings that XML. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Three hours wasted. <laughs> the, 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 set, the settings that Gradle that KTS, uh, it's a Kotlin version, a build cache, and I'm pointing it to a remote build, which is actually a Docker container running on this machine, and I'm saying also that I'm the reference. So I want the build cache to be populated, not only queried, but populated from my build. And what I'm doing with that is here, I'm just going to do, no, not, not any of these. And I can delete the clean, sorry, that was a bit the preparation of the demo. I'm going to do a compile test Java, because that's where we'll see an effect. And I needed the clean. <laughs> <laughs> Gradle is too smart. Yeah, exactly. So, because otherwise, uh, and now what I can go is I can go to my build node, refresh it, and I see that my cache says it contains two entries. So, like we said, the scenario we're demoing, and it's a short demo, but it shows the power, is if we switch to Cedric's machine. Yeah. Maybe you can run the test one while I'm doing this. So yeah. here I'm just checking out the project. I don't have it locally. So I'm checking out the project. So going to demo live stats. I'm going to check the settings file. And this is your IP yep. or not? Yep, should be. Should be, OK. So we agree that I didn't build anything locally. So if I run Gradle wrapper, let's do that properly. 
compile test driver, you said. Yep. It's going to compile the wheel. Oh. And I get two from cache. So what does it mean? It means actually it didn't build locally. What it did is fetching the results from the Docker image uh, of the cache that Louis is running on his laptop. And you can now run the tests. And now test took what? How, how long did it take for you? So my build with running the test took 29 seconds. So, so yeah. It, it, so imagine I come was in the done. morning and I have an update. Uh, I do just uh, git pull, run tests, and then actually I didn't change locally anything. So it should be immediate. So I didn't run locally, but the test task was actually executed on his laptop. So I don't have to run it. So imagine that you have this on a uh, CI server, you could get the, the results from the CI server. That's actually the setup that you, we use at Gradle. So something interesting is that if I go to the timeline and go to the test task, I can go there and it's going to say, hey, actually I got a hit and I can even uh, find, well, we don't have time to show that, no. but we can find exactly what build produced the output in the cache. And I think we're, we're so running we're out of time, so... Yeah, exactly, and that stuff disappeared, of course. In any case, fun. if you're interested in all these details, come to see us at the booth tomorrow, not today, of course. That was it. Thanks a lot for your attention. I hope you, we gave you the will and the <laughs> interest in testing out Gradle. And again, happy to, happy to chat. Thanks a lot. Thanks.